Welcome to One on One. I'm Phil Tillman, your host, in our continuing effort to introduce you to the candidates who will be running for political office on November the 4th of this year. We're delighted to welcome into our studio Mary Beth Carroza from Ocean City. Yes, sir. And more importantly, from the new district. 38C, is that right? Yes, sir. Mary Beth Carroza, District 38C, C for Carroza. Well, how about helping us a little bit? Tell us a little bit about the boundaries of 38C. It's new, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's a new district, and it's very exciting. I'm finding when I'm out on the campaign trail, I'm doing a lot of educating. Um, it's uh, The district combines both Worcester and Wicomico counties. <laughs> it includes the eastern part of Wicomico County. So pretty much uh, the eastern part, um, starting um, when you cross the line at Worcester all the way up to the bypass um, in Salisbury. So that would include uh, Willards, uh, Powellville, Parsonsburg, Pittsville, uh, Kilburnie, um, you know, pretty much you know, coming right up to the bypass, but not Salisbury itself. The district also includes um, all of Ocean Pines, which is where the population base would be. Uh, just that's where the concentration is for the county of Worcester County and it includes the um, northern part of Worcester County starting in Newark and North which um, as I said it's all of Ocean Pines um, it includes Ocean City, West Ocean City, South Point and those areas as well. Wow yeah well you're very familiar with them and um, and the whole district what does what do the people in Pittsville have in common with the people in Ocean Pines? Um, that's that's a great question, and it's one that I can answer um, by saying they they all care about the future and our young people. Whether I'm on the campaign trail in Pittsville, um, whether I'm in Ocean City, um, you know, whether I'm in Ocean Pines, uh, people want to talk about the future. Yeah, Mary Beth, if may I call you Mary Beth? Um, what? issues. Well, tell us a little bit about your background. Let's get that out of the way. Everybody doesn't know you. A lot of people know you, I know, but tell us a little bit about it. Well, you. I appreciate that opportunity, um, and I will give a little bit of background. Um, and it starts with my family. Um, my folks, uh, when I was in fifth grade, decided that it was time to leave the big city and moved us down to Ocean City. We had the first fast food drive through restaurant in Ocean City called Beefy's. Ooh. And uh, so small family business, and all of us um, as children grew up in that family business. Um, I was pretty much working full time in sixth grade and onward, um, learning my work ethic from my parents. And it was great. I mean, it was a, a great place to grow up because you learned um, early on that um, you needed to make your money when the tourists were in town. And um, it, was, it was great because we, um, our church was right in the same neighborhood. We, our house was right there. So, you know, you could walk to everything. And I thank my parents um, almost every day for making the wise decision to move us to the Eastern Shore. Yeah. And, and so I'm a, I'm a graduate of Stephen Decatur High School. Um, and um, it, again, very proud of that. Um, enjoyed playing tennis. Uh, for Stephen Decatur. As a matter of fact, that's where I was really able to meet some wonderful friends in Salisbury. When growing up in Ocean City, if you wanted to have any real competition in tennis, you had to come over to Salisbury. And as you'll recall, back in the uh, mid to late 70s, that was a very exciting mm. time when Bill Reardon was organizing the tennis program here. We had major tournaments coming in. Um, C.J. Travers over at the YMCA um, was a coach for a lot of us um, who wanted to try to, uh, you know, improve our, our talent on the courts. And I just have really fond memories of coming over. I mean, he worked us hard. We'd be on those courts at the YMCA five and six hours in the summer. He would, you know, he would drill us. Um, he would have us do wind sprints in the heat of the day and that was tough and then we would play each other and uh, Lori Malone uh, who is now Lori Hessen and the Malone family mm -hmm. were very kind 
and, uh, and they would uh, put me up in their home right here in Salisbury and say, okay, we've got a tennis tournament this weekend. Instead of going back and forth between Ocean City and Salisbury, you can just stay with us. And, and so I have really fond memories, and it, it's been great to come back and see uh, some of the same people that I played tennis with years ago that are now community leaders, but some of them still playing tennis too. Yeah, yeah. Well, Lori's not here, but Nelson and Pat Malone are still around here. And, and Gene. Very good friends. And Gene, of course, is a banker. And uh, I think uh, several of his kids maybe played tennis. I know they all played soccer. And uh, Well, I can tell you Lori's still playing tennis because I ran into her yesterday on the tennis courts in Ocean City. Well, I'll and be. And she came, um, Marie Thomas, somebody obviously from Salisbury who's now running the um, Ocean City Women's uh, Tennis Program. Um, she organizes us, and she um, she found out that Lori was down in Ocean City visiting, and invited Lori to play with us. And then here we are, reconnected from high school. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it is. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit about your personal background. Um, you ever been involved in politics at all? Yes, sir. Um, I'm proud of my public service. Um, I've been very fortunate that I've um, worked for. Uh, elected officials that have been very committed to public service. Um, when, it, when I tie this to the Eastern Shore, Governor Bob Ehrlich gave me the opportunity to serve in his administration. And I'm proud of that. Uh, he gave me the opportunity to work with local business leaders, uh, with community leaders, with our elected officials, and understood that if we were to get anything done, you had to have a strong partnership at the local level. Also, by working for Governor Ehrlich um, as his Deputy Chief of Staff for four years, that allowed me to be home. I would, I would come home every weekend, mm -hmm. and there were events that obviously he was not able to attend given his schedule and commitment statewide, and he would ask me to represent him at various events in Worcester County and Wicomico County, and that was terrific. Uh, that's where I did meet some of our um, local city officials, some of our county commissioners. So now coming back all these years later and now as my first time on the ballot, I've tried to go back to some of the people that I worked with early on to ask for their advice and their guidance um, so I would um, be in a good position to understand the priorities at this point in time. Yeah. Well, what do you think are the big issues facing the state of Maryland in the in the years right ahead of us? Well, that's a really important question and one of the reasons why I started my door-to-door -door a year out from the primary. So I actually started my door-to-door -door on June 24th of 2013 and for a lot of different reasons. One, I thought it was important that people knew that I was going to get out and earn their support. Two, because it was a new district, I found that I really need to do a lot of education and let them know that they were in the new district. And, but the most important reason for my getting out so early is so I could be on a listening tour and go into every jurisdiction in the two counties, in eastern uh, Wicomico County and the northern part of Worcester County. And I have been in every jurisdiction. And in this listening tour, I wanted to hear directly from the voters, to hear it, to hear what they thought was most important without it being filtered. And it's been wonderful, it's been uplifting, and I believe it'll, be, it'll allow me to take strong positions for the shore because I'm hearing directly uh, from the voters on these issues. When you ask about specific issues, I'll start with first um, what you asked me in the beginning. It, it starts with um, how much everyone cares about the future and wanting their families and their children and grandchildren, if they so choose to stay on the shore, that there would be opportunities that they can raise their families here. I think one, some, something that I hear consistently on the trail is we do a great job of educating our young people here. You know, the school systems are strong here on the shore. And then we also have, you know, we have Warwick, we have Salisbury University, we have UMES. So we great, do a great job of educating our young people, but sometimes what you hear is that our young people will leave to find opportunities elsewhere. Um, 
that makes me want to just double down and work even harder for more economic opportunities in this area. Good. Well, 38C, what are the big issues in 38C in addition to caring about well, the issue you, ju you just said, which is a statewide issue? Well, Phil, I think you would agree that our two economic drivers in this district, um, 38C, northern part of Worcester County, the eastern part of Wicomico County, would be agriculture and would be tourism. And when you talk about those two economic drivers, we talk about them in a broad sense. When we talk about farming, we talk about not only what's going on on the farms and in the fields, but we're talking about all the ag-related businesses. Um, we're talking about the poultry industry. We're talking about everything related to that and the, um, the businesses that are connected and supporting that. Um, so that is a very broad area and what I'm hearing is that we need to continue to support policies that will keep farming, our poultry industry strong and I'm committed to that. Mm -hmm. The other key economic dr driver is tourism and everything related to that when you think about everything related to our waters. I mean, you know, we're all so proud to live on the shore. It's one of the most beautiful areas, not only in the state, but the entire country. And you think about, you know, tourism, not just Ocean City and the beaches there. You think about all the boating and you think about supporting that, um, our, our um, watermen who are going out and su supporting um, the, the restaurants. So we have, the, you know, the best seafood, um, you know, anywhere in the world. I'll, I'll put that up and out there. and. You talk about the boating industry and related businesses. Um, so I look at it as you, you have tourism and, and farming and you have all the related businesses. So I'm again committed to um, supporting policies that will keep those two economic drivers strong. But I want to talk a little bit about what I would say is the third leg of the stool that I think probably needs to be um, strengthened. And that would be in the area of high tech. And I think that we, at every level, um, local, state, federal, um, public sector, private sector, um, academia, if we can focus a little bit more on our partnerships, on how we could strengthen and draw and um, have incentives for more high tech in this area. We have so much opportunity. We have uh, NASA wallops. Um, you have uh, the Navy presence down there. Um, you know, you, you know, you've got the launches, you've got the engineer program, you've got Warwick and UMES and SU that can, can strengthen that partnership. You've got these small um, business entrepreneurs who um, I think if they understand um, what, is a, what is going on down at NASA Wallops, they can better support what's going on down there. And I'm talking about, you know, the, the small business entrepreneurs, the ones that will actually take a risk and invest in, in high tech. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I just am coming off of a, a visit. Um, I was invited to a meeting earlier this week at the Eastern Shore Defense Alliance. And that's a, a true partnership between the private sector and your representatives in the government down at NASA Wallops, but then you also had your state level officials, Virginia and Maryland, and you had your local officials. As a matter of fact, I ran into a couple people from uh, Salisbury at this meeting. Yeah. Well, we've heard on this program, we've had representatives from the, um, from the fiber op optic uh, folks that ran the cable, fiber optic cable, from NASA up through SU and then right across and hooked through, I think it actually runs under the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, but that none of that touches your district. So I guess one of the big challenges would be to get fiber optic, optic access for businesses who wanted to be in 38C, perhaps. Oh, well, that's exactly right. And, and also the way I would approach this, if, um, if I'm blessed enough to be elected, and I believe I'm on track to do so, I look at it that you're a representative of the shore. And what's good for maybe the southern part of Worcester County is also good for the, the that can benefit the northern part of Worcester County. And I also want to make the case that what we do on the shore is important to the entire state of Maryland. 
I think we can more effectively make that case. And let me tell you why. If you think about it, everybody in Maryland has some tie to the shore. Either they came down here for Senior Week in Ocean City, um, perhaps their uh, family members have a retirement home or a second <laughs> home, perhaps they're planning to retire somewhere on the shore. They might have sent their children to SU um, or one of our other um, institutions. And I look at that and I think, okay, if everybody in Maryland has some tie to the shore, if we can make a case for what we are supporting down here, uh, the policies that we support down here are really good for the entire state. In other words, we bridge that difference instead of us against them, um, because we'll always be outnumbered as far as sheer numbers. I think we can bridge and talk about what we have in common and have the um, shore as a source of pride for all of Maryland. Yeah. Well, let's talk a minute about us against them. You're, you're really referring to the Eastern Shore and the, the big metropolises on the uh, Western Shore, but there's also Republicans and Democrats. This is a Democratic state, but the Eastern Shore is represented primarily by Republicans. How, how, do, you, how do you make your voice heard as the minority party in state government? That's a good question, and I first would point to the fact that I already have some experience in that area. When Governor Ehrlich was elected in 2002, he asked me if I would leave my position at the Pentagon and come home to Maryland and serve in his administration. And he made very clear, um, in order for us to get anything done, if you look at the sheer numbers, that of course you have to work in a bipartisan way. And I'm very proud of our service during those four years. And the way we were able to achieve our accomplishments is that we had to work with the other side and we had to find common ground. And sometimes you have to declare victory at 65 percent and because if you hold out for 100 percent you might not get anything. So I'm, I'm proud of those four years of public service and I think it also shows that I've been able to uh, work in an administration um, that did a really good job um, for the state of Maryland. If you'll recall we inherited a $4 billion deficit and we turned it around and left the state with a $2 billion surplus. We did good work in the area of um, public safety, homeland security, which we really didn't have a lot in place after September 11th. And when Governor Ehrlich came in, he did want to put a focus on um, public safety. I'm proud of what we did in the area with the environment, uh, with the Chesapeake Bay and with our schools. So. I look at that and I'm proud of that public service at the state level and I would like to be able in this new position as state delegate to use that experience and have it be a benefit to our local area here. Um, you also asked about how, how do you get something done. Again, I'm going to go back to the point I made of what's good for the shore is really good for all of Maryland. And I would like to uh, be able to identify uh, Democrats on the Western Shore who are hearing the same thing in their districts. Um, some of these are common issues across the state. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, everything, everybody I'm talking to really wants to make Maryland more business friendly. They're very concerned about losing um, major employers, small businesses, our families to other states. I'm a competitive person. I don't want to lose our families to other states. So I think what we need to do again um, at every level is to make sure that we're working together on policies that will keep our families and our businesses here in Maryland. And I know that I can find partners um, on the other side of the bridge and in the other party to do that. When you get to Annapolis, and you're the delegate from 38C, and you go to the uh, Mike Bush, and you say, "Here's the committees I want to serve on." What, what? If, if he said, "I'm going to give you any committee you want," what committees would you choose? That's a great question, and it's um, though at this point a little premature. I want to continue my listening visits. I am finding out that the best ideas come from talking to people. 
I have had some other people. It's been very uplifting that I am able to uh, have the benefit of the direct feedback from the voters. I've also had some people um, who have pointed out there are some delegates now, some of them are in leadership, who have asked me that question, have you thought about committee assignments? I want to first be very clear, number one, I'm putting all my time and energy to earn the support of the voters. And that is why I'm going door to door and I'm working as hard as I can. I really am working hard for a cross section of support in this district from Republicans to Democrats to independents because there's so much that we do have in common. So as I'm listening, I've already kind of pointed out what I believe are the priorities for this area, which are keeping tourism strong, keeping farming strong, and then trying to work in this, do a little bit more in this high tech area. I would like to probably turn to people that have more experience to say, if this is what I picked up um, that I need to focus on, these are the priorities of 38C, where do you think I can be most effective? What committees do you think that I you know, should serve on or at least request to be considered to serve on? I also want to point out that even if I'm not on a committee, I am going to work those issues. And I know how to do that because I've worked at the federal level and I've worked for, um, in le for legislative committees. I've worked for members of Congress and I know the legislative process. So I believe that even if I'm not assigned to the committee of choice, um, any committee really, you're gonna be able to do great sure. work for your district. But I will find um, partners on those committees that I don't serve on to make sure they understand that the priorities of not only District 38C, but of the shore. I've asked this question of several people. Um, Agriculture, the poultry industry is so important to the entire shore, certainly to your district. Is it possible to be supportive of the poultry industry and also also be committed to uh, a clean environment? Absolutely. And I am glad you brought that question up because um, I believe that the approach I've been taking as a candidate, um, I've been doing that and I'm bridging that. Again, sitting down with folks locally. Um, I've been on farms and I've walked around, um, whether they're, you know, corn and soybeans in Willards or, um, you know, poultry farm in Parsonsburg. Um, I've also s sat down with um, some of our environmental groups basically to say, you know, how do we um, address these issues? Um, if there are issues, the, the, the issue that comes to mind are the proposed um, phosphorus regulations. I believe that what we need to do on issues like that is when you first start talking about new regulations, pull in the farm farmers from the very beginning. Number one, I think they can, they'll let you know if something's gonna work or not. Um, again, it should be based on sound science and they may have ideas on the best way to approach some of these issues because they're the best stewards of the land. Mm -hmm. And they are so vested in wanting to pass their land along to their families. So I look at it that it should be an inclusive approach, that you should have the key um, players at the table from the very beginning. I think the frustration comes in sometimes when um, some of the regulations are presented when they're too far along in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're trying to reverse something that um, you know could be bad for a certain segment, like the farmers. My point would be, if you pulled them in from the very beginning and, and worked with them at that point, I think we would come up with better policies that would reflect the priorities of both agriculture and the environmentalist. Yeah. Our old good friend Lou Riley used to say that the farmers are the best environmentalists because they want their land to be clean and do with best practices. Uh, when it was voluntary, when he was Secretary of Agriculture, it was the those practices were voluntary and most of the farmers complied with them. 
the other... Well, you gave me an opening there. Okay, go. Secretary Lou Riley, I have to let you know that um, all of us, starting uh, with Governor Ehrlich and everybody in Governor Ehrlich's administration, just had the utmost respect for um, Lou Riley, not only for his expertise in farming, but just the man himself. And, you know, I watched how he would um, present at cabinet meetings and just be able to, you know, take the issues of the shore at a cabinet meeting and talk to the governor and the other cabinet secretaries and really educate all of us on the importance of what we were doing on the shore. So, you know, I have learned so much from Secretary Riley and also I watched him, I watched his commitment to public service when his wife was so sick and he would, you know, go back and forth from home to Annapolis. And he continued his public service, although he had this family situation that he was taking care of. And, you know, I'll never forget Governor Ehrlich said to Secretary Riley, whatever you need to do, you do, but I would like you to continue to be part of the cabinet if you can do that with your family situation. Mm -hmm. And watching how he handled that, that is something I want to emulate. So I learned a lot from Secretary Riley, and I hope that he'll continue to let me knock on his door and he'll continue to give me advice and guidance on, on not just agriculture, but public service in general. You have several s subdivisions in your district. You have Worcester County, Wicomico County. You have the several towns Ocean City, Ocean Pines, Berlin, and then the, the towns that you mentioned in East Wicomico County. Um, how do you be a liaison with those county governments and city governments with the state of Maryland, which how the state treats those subdivisions is pretty important to their budgets and, and how they serve their people. Absolutely. I think you start by um, first attending their meetings and having individual relationships with the local elected officials, which I do. I have um, been attending the town meetings and I've been trying to make a point to, um, at, at this point as a candidate, to let them know I am in listening mode. I want to understand the priorities in each of the individual jurisdictions. I'm never going to overpromise because we all know the budget situations at the local level and at the state level and at the federal level. So I don't think it's a matter of overpromising that, you know, um, I'm going to go and secure this grant or secure this funding. But I do think what's important is that if I understand the priorities directly from the local elected officials, that if there is a certain budget, I do want to make sure there's always going to be government spending. So I want to make sure the shore gets its fair share, and I will be a fighter for that. We just have a couple of minutes left, believe it or not. I want you to pretend that camera is a front door, and you're going to go knock on the door, and this is your opportunity to give those people uh, your message. Well, I, I appreciate summing up that way because I've been going door to door literally since June 24th of 2013. And the way I've been doing it and getting the best information um, from the voters is, you know, I knock on a door, I let them know my name is Mary Beth Carroza. I am a Republican candidate for state delegate in, the, in a new district, 38C, and as I like to say, C is for Carosa. <laughs> and I let the voters uh, tell me what's important to them and what I've been picking up and where I believe that I should continue to focus my energy is to look at how we can keep our families on the shore with opportunities for the future. And I talk about protecting the shore way of life. What I mean by that is in all aspects, our economic opportunities, excellence in schools, public safety. And one area that I also want to mention is working with our veterans. Um, I have found that uh, our veterans have so much to offer, and, but we need to support the returning veterans. So not only can they adjust to coming back to our local communities, but they can thrive. These are our leaders. These are the ones who um, served, uh, courageously served to protect our freedoms. I just would like the voters to know that I am out to earn your support. 
I want to hear from you, and I'm committed to protecting our sure way of life. Thank you, Mary Beth Carosa, uh, 37C. 38C. 38C. <laughs> 38C. Uh, House of Delegates uh, candidate, and we're delighted to have you in our studio here in Salisbury, Maryland. And thanks for being here. Thank you. I hope you'll have me back. Oh, we, we will. <laughs> thank you. And we want to thank you for being with us also right here on Pack 14. <laughs>